I'm Steve Ewing, and I'm actually the treasurer of the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard. So the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard has been around for how long? Well, we're going on 35 years or so. It's not exactly cast in stone when it started. It's a little lost in the mists, as they say. Uh, but my father and mother and some other local people decided instead of meeting on the street, they would formalize things a little bit. And they, in the 80s, early 80s, they started to get together. So it's been, um, it's been a while, it's been around a while. And I love the way you put that. You brought the, the mists of the moors of the old country into, into your, your, your setting of the scene there. Uh, that, and we have a bunch of beautiful mist around the, the island waters too, especially this time of year with the fog. And what was the purpose of, of organizing actual get-togethers with other Scottish folk? Right, yeah. Well, there was a few different reasons. I mean, the main reason, of course, was to be able to drink in public together, good Scotch whiskey. And uh, actually, that was the excuse to get together and raise funds for a scholarship um, fund where we uh, contribute to the uh, keeping our local delinquents out of jail and sending them off to college. And, uh, and really just to share all things Scottish. Um, I would say, and I give a lot of credit to a woman named Duncan MacDonald, also no, known as um, Scotland's first lady in America. Duncan uh, was born in Texas, changed her name to Duncan because there was a, uh, another Dorothy MacDonald living in the same town. And a uh, very precocious young woman from an early age went out on her own, actually um, helped found National Public Radio in New York years ago and uh, got very involved with her Scottish lineage and heritage. And when she actually, after her friends convinced her to move to Martha's Vineyard in the uh, 70s, I think. And one thing led to another, she met my dad, Harvey Ewing, who was a newspaper, who was a court reporter. He was the uh, bureau chief for the Cape Cod Times. First, the Standard Times. We started out in the 50s here and uh, covering the island for the New Bedford paper. And then um, um, became the Cape Cod Times. And, and, and um, Donald McRae and Bob Mackay, who came over from Scotland with his family. And they all got together and they decided to um, form the society, form an organization to really um, get to know their own roots and to share, you know, the food, the drink, the conviviality of being a Scot on Martha's Vineyard. So it all started with this, this one woman who really kind of rooted the vineyard Scots people, the Scotsmen and women in their heritage. And, and she just kind of revived and resuscitated that Scottish spirit. Yeah, you know, there's, it, it's an interesting dynamic, Laurel. You know, um, I've traveled to Scotland with my wife, Claudia, you know, a number of times, and my folks have too. And you go to Scotland and there's not a lot of interest or not as much interest in Scotland in um, Scottish um, history or heraldry or genealogy because they're living it. In America, we're transplanted and we're all American, but we do come from somewhere, of course. And if you come from, if you come from anywhere, but if you come from Scotland or Ireland, you know, um, you're trying to find your identity or recapture that identity, that sense of identity. So, um, you know, it's obviously easier if you coalesce around like-minded people, of course, you know, and, and that's what happened. And Duncan was the one that kind of lit that, you know, match and that, that fuse, you know. Is she, is, she's no longer with us or she's still with us? No, Duncan. Uh, was the last surviving member of the uh, Scottish Society, and she passed away at the uh, young age of 104 years old. Uh, yeah, that would be last year. Wow. 20. I, I do remember. I do remember reading about her. Wow. Yeah, yeah great lady. I mean, multifaceted, multi-talented, mostly in the city. You know, she got her fame. She moved. To New York City, I believe she was 19 years old, 
and you know, I mean, obviously she was born a while ago. She lived to be 104, and um, just struck out on her own. Never married, single woman, and really made her mark in New York in radio and TV, early TV. And then got when she, well, like I said, when she got involved with her Scottish heritage, she became um, um, big in these different Scottish societies in America. And uh, she actually was, um, I could segue into Tartan Day, which is what we're talking about here a little bit. Right, coming up on Tuesday. Yeah, the six. And um, so Duncan was um, really one of the real, um, the thrust of the, the incorporation of Tartan Day both the recognition by the Senate and the House of Representatives. And um, if I, you don't mind, um, Titan Day is another institution where Duncan's hand can be seen. Although Canada gets the credit for founding Titan Day in 1986, the United States formally launched it in 1997. Um, historians now believe an initiative of the American Scottish Foundation in 1974, in which Duncan was involved, an action-packed Scottish week in New York City was a real catalyst for the U.S. paying more attention to its Scots heritage. And this is from um, an, an article called Scotland's First Lady in America, highlighting Duncan. And that led to, in 1997, the congressional record, which, and I'll just paraphrase you know, a bit of it, Many organizations were involved in making the observance of Titan Day on April 6th a success. There are clan societies, clubs, and fraternal associations and individual Scots Americans representing literally millions of Americans nationwide that participated. Uh, this is done by, signed by, or promoted by Trent Lott back then in the, in the Senate in 1997. He goes on to say, St. Andrew's Society, the city of Charleston, it's the first St. Andrew's Society in the United States, St. Andrew's Society in New York, the second oldest society in the United States, and the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. And that's in the congressional record um, of the 105th Congress on April 7th in 1992, 1997. And then it was, um, then it was ratified in 98 by the Senate. And then again, by the House of Representatives in, um, in 1999. And what this does is it recognizes what we call our the Declaration of Independence, it's called the Declaration of Arbroath, which celebrated, it's the Declaration of Arbroath was written by a woman, a monk named Bernard Linton in 1320. And he was appealing to the Pope at the time to get the English out of Scotland, basically, and to claim our sovereignty and our right as an independent country. In 1320, we celebrated our 700th anniversary of the Declaration of Arbroath, or Titan Day, uh, last year. And um, it was signed by each one of these little, this is a linen document, parchment, each one of these strings is basically ended with a seal stamped with a noble. And it was signed by um, basically the, the nobility of Scotland. And it, it is appealing to the Pope, the head of the church, which was the head of you know, the country really at that time, the countries at that time. And if I may, um, it, it basically, explain Scotland's history and how it existed long before England did on its own as an independent country governing itself. And it's pretty much summed up what they were saying. And this is when Edward the first, this is the wars of independence of Scotland. If you know, William Wallace, you know, and that gang, you know, fighting for, you know, Braveheart, the rights of independence at Stirling, Scotland. Um, and then on to Robert the Bruce fighting at Bannockburn and defeating the English, you know, and, um, but again, Robert the Bruce was only 
first among equals. And this was a new concept to break from the divine right of kings where Scotland says to the Pope, yet if he, that's Robert, the king, King Robert, should give up what he has begun, which was to get us our independence, seeking to make us or our kingdom subject to the King of England or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy, that's Robert, and the subverter of his own right and ours, <clears throat> and make some other man who was able to defend us our king. For, and this is the famous line you might have heard, for as long as a hundred of us remain alive, never will we on any conditions be subjected to the lordship of the English. It is in truth not for glory, nor for riches, nor honors that we are fighting, but for freedom alone, which no honest man gives up but with life itself. And so that's the beginning. That's what we're celebrating. This is what this country was founded on. They learned, Jefferson took this from the Scots and, and create, and with him and a few other guys, and not enough women, unfortunately, but a few other men, white men, helped create this country. Basically modeled after the De Declaration of Arbroath. Wow. So Tartan Day is your Independence Day. And it's, there's so much history to really sink into. And, you know, of course, you watch the Hollywood movie Braveheart, and you, you think you kind of know, but you know, also that there's so much um, creative license taken with those kinds of things. But it does draw you into the the characters, if I can quote, use air quotes here, of of the history of Scotland. And and so here on Martha's Vineyard, we have a, a really rich Scottish faction of, of humans here on the island that that really was formed by Duncan. And Duncan and a, Duncan and a group of about 10 founders, original founders, yeah, correct. And how many members do you have right now? Well, it varies, but we're, you know, when we have our burn supper, which is a big event we have every January the 25th third week uh, that celebrates Robert Burns's, Robbie Burns's birthday, the Bard of Scotland. Uh, we get up, we turn people away at 100, you know, so, but we have maybe 75 members, members, that's family members and individuals. Do you have to, uh, how can you become a member of the Scottish Society? Do you have to prove that your lineage? No, no, no. We're very inclusive. No, this is something that um, the only there's a, there's one requirement is you cannot be against things Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically it. No, we have we're you know we we actually now we're having our um, we're having our burn suppers. We've moved from the Harbour View, which was a nice spot too, but a little bit formal for us to the uh, in the spirit of Burns to the Portuguese American Club on New York Avenue, and we find that to be a good fit. Yeah, it feels like it would be with the spirit uh, that that you kind of pin to the Scots people, very strong and powerful, but very rustic and, you know, worldly. And so the Scottish, you know, clan uh, means children. The word clan is, means child. And the clan um, centers around the family. And um, if you can imagine the, the, um, your own family, you know, and what you would do for your family, well, you know, expand that to the country, to the people. And not just, you know, your own blood family. You know, you didn't have to be a member of a family to be in a clan, you know, biologically necessarily. You had to be what's called in sib or you had to you had to get along and not only get along but you had to uh you know defend that family and these are times i mean a lot of the history of scotland and great britain in general 
and and of course Europe, I mean too, but especially in in Scotland, is um is very violent. And it's um as you look at the history, and it's about it's all revolving around one battle or another. And so, you know, just for survival, people are defending themselves, but they're doing it in the spirit of defending their family. So in SIB, does that mean, it sounds like it's like in, in brotherhood and sisterhood and, you know, almost like, I know it's probably not the word that it's taken from, but sibling and, and just this, it, it, it feels very familial. There's a, there's a great spirituality too involved in all this. It's overarching, you know, and, you know, speaking talk of- Talk a little family, bit about that. Can you talk a little bit about the spirituality of that? Well, I heard, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it get it goes way back. I mean- you know, we're an earth-centered pagan group. And so, you know, we were the ones that not only, well, I mean, it, it's it's debated who did a lot of the stone circles, the standing stones and, and the- uh, Stonehenge? You know, yeah, Stonehenge being down South in England. And, you know, um, and if you go to Scotland and you go to Ireland, you'll see everywhere, um, you know, the, these um, monuments, you know, stone monuments. And, um, you know, the people are very close to the land. They're tied to the land. I mean, both the cultures, I, I, I group Ireland in with Scotland because I am Scots-Irish. And the DNA, which I've been involved with, you know, the study of for a long time too, in genealogical research, ties the um, west of Scotland, you know, with the north of Ireland directly um but the spiritual aspect it, it's really nature centered saint patrick came over you know and and other monks came over you know to scotland and um and were slaughtered by the north you know and standing up for their the the new religion which was christianity of course um but it it it, it blended itself with the, the cultures, all the, the, the churches were built on the sites of the old temples. And that goes on throughout the world, of course, you know, but it's strong in, it's strong in, in Scotland, um, the spiritual aspect of things. I mean, from the fairies to the, you know, to you go right down the line to all clans had a brownie, which was in, lived in the castle and told the king or the chief of the clan what to do. And, I could, that's a whole nother show. I mean, you could go on Yeah, and on well, and the fact that. that you're you're in National Animals, the unicorn, right? Isn't the Scotland yeah. National Animals? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, yeah, we're, 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 that's our bent. You know, again, you know, it gets a little bit far-fetched sometimes, but still, I, uh, I did want to mention something. I don't know how much time we have, but I wanted to get into a little bit about our own time. Yes, and, please. So is it, is it a vineyard tartan or is it a, a Ewing tartan? Well, okay. So um, I'll talk about the Ewing tartan briefly. Your, your family tartan. That, that's a whole nother show too, but the, the shirt I'm wearing is McEwen. I don't know if you're on TV here or radio, but um, We're this both. is a, both. yeah. So this is, um, this is uh, the McEwen tartan. The motto is Riverisco. Uh, it means we shall grow again or come again. Like, and our 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 um, emblem is a the crest is an oak stump with the suckers coming out of it, and it means our clan was um, we, we're lost. We have a um, our clan was taken over. Our land was taken. Without the land, you have nothing as a clan usually, but our clan was basically taken over by the Campbells. We were on the, the eastern shore of a sea lock called Loch Fine. And in the late 1400s, um, James IV was consolidating power and trying to get rid of the Norwegians, you know, those pesky, pesky Vikings on the west coast of Scotland, which had their own government over there, really, in the Hebrides and the Orkneys and on the mainland too. And in the process of that was trying to consolidate the power. And so the Campbells were a big clan. You've heard of them. And they uh, they took over uh, the McEwens. And 
in the course of time, we all, Ewing, McEwen, Ewan, Owen, lots of different names were under that banner of the McEwen and this, with this, with this kilt, with this tartan. Um, until recently, and I was very involved with this in the last 10 years, an historian in, in the borders named John McEwen um, actually differentiated between the Ewings and the McEwens. And so I brought a shawl of my wife's, which is, um, which is a very different color. This is a red color. And it's, this is the new Ewing Titan. And so I have switched to this. My dad was a McEwen and my brother is a McEwen because my brother won't buy his own kilt. So I gave him my old McEwen kilt. And now I wear the Ewing Titan. So you've created your own tartan. You have your own tartan now. Well, the, the, the Ewings do. And we differentiated ourselves from, from the McEwens. Um, so that's the clan tartan. But the original tartans, the original tartans were district tartans. And they, um, they originated um, by the local berries and different dyes that they might find in the area. And so, you know, sheep, they're, they're weaving wool and they're making, you know, shawls and kilts or kilts weren't really big until later on. Uh, but mostly, you know, things like kilts or coverings and wraps, more like a blanket that a man would, or a woman would wrap around him. And um, I just wanted to read from something that um, talks about the district titan, and also about our own vineyard, Martha's Vineyard district titan. And um, although we tend to associate the titan with a Scottish or Irish clan, the first titans were district titans. The colors were typically obtained from the local berries and other plants used to dye yarn. Over time, these patterns became associated with specific clans or families, just like snowflakes. No two titans are alike. To be recognized, all new titans must be registered with the Scottish Registry of Titans. Close attention is paid to color and thread count, so no new titans will not so new titans will not compete with existing ones. So when we were designing, when Thor John Ewing was designing this, it you send the 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 thread count and the uh, the pattern. All GM, it's all geometric pattern repeating itself to the registry of titans in Scotland. And they kick it back, you'd say, no, it's too close to such and such a titan until you finally get it distinctive enough. So you can register it as, you know, as it's been ad adapted. Martha's Vineyard has its own district titan. On a visit to Martha's Vineyard, world renowned author and titan designer, Dr. Philip Smith, a descendant of our first governor, Thomas Mayhew was so taken by his ancestor's island that he designed the Titan just for Martha's Vineyard. In his grant of use to the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard, Dr. Smith writes, the Titan is symbolic, blue for the sea, white for the surf, green for the island, and black for the many men and women lost at sea beginning with Thomas Mayhew and including my own ancestor, Philip Smith, 1746 to 1792. And a condition of Dr. Smith's grant of use was that the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard needed to reproduce the Titan within five years of his grant. Since that time, the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard has woven many yards of both shades of Titan, modern and ancient. The articles you see on display, this is at the museum, Martha's Vineyard Museum, we're selling some of these articles, are uh, the result of these efforts. All fabric and articles are produced through the Loch Caron Mill in Scotland. The Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard uses any profits to help maintain an annual scholarship fund. And each spring we award scholarships to graduating island students to help fund their education, which was the point of basically starting the whole society in the first place. So these, so the sale of these tartans, which you can get at the Martha's Vineyard Museum, 
proceeds go to the scholarship fund. Correct. Wow. And so how long have you had the scholarship? Well, since the society's inception, over 30 years. And you give it to, uh, what's the criterion for the student? Yeah, you know, um, so just like all the other institutions on Martha's Vineyard that uh, donate, that, you know, award scholarships, um, we have a, a sentence or two that says you have to um, show your interest or connection with Scotland and, uh, you know, just or, and or describe your, uh, your Scottish, uh, you know, um, ancestry. You don't have to be Scottish, obviously, to, to get the award. Um, you just, like I say, you can't be against Scotland or anything. You have to prove that you like the country and that you have some interest in it. And I actually am the chairman of the scholarship committee. And we just, we've just had the cutoff date, um, the middle of March. And by the end of this month, we'll, we'll look, we got five applications this year. We had 11 last year, I think. And we'll, we'll donate maybe five or $6,000 in individual five, maybe $1,000 scholarships to five, maybe, maybe all, all the students, I don't know. Yeah. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So people can, this coming Tuesday, April 6th, Yep, and um, I just have to check it in my mental calendar there. April 6th is Tartan Day, and you have a bunch of things planned for Tartan Day to celebrate your Independence Day. Um, how can people celebrate with you? www.mvscots.org. They can go to the website. They can um, look, if they're members of the museum, Martha Fair Museum, they will see linked on their website um, a... Uh, an introductory or a link to the to our website and they can go there just like our burn supper this year we're doing all this virtually so this is the first time we've done this virtually i write poetry so i'm going to read a couple of poems that i've written about the tartan and uh, the district tartan it's a, it's i didn't get into the fact that i was um charged with um getting this tartan woven originally the martha's vineyard tartan and just to be brief i in the in the attempt to get the first um group of articles available for our burn supper in january uh these things take a while to be designed or to be created you know it's all all of our titan articles are woven and manufactured in scotland you know we don't do anything and you know it has to be authentic yeah yeah it's got to be authentic so you know we don't make a lot of money because Scots don't typically spend a lot of money on things if they can help it. So we try to keep our articles affordable. And so to have a good quality, it's still affordable is always a little bit of a trick. But anyway, so we were trying to get, I was trying to get these articles, you know, generated. And this is a few years back. And I had a time frame because Phil Smith, the designer, gave us five years to create fabric from his design and then market the articles and, you know, and the first time I did it, I was dealing with the mill in Scotland, Loch Karen. And the woman I was dealing with was named Joy, who I've gone over and met eventually, you know, and been to the mill and all that. But she suggested the color, you know, the tone, the, the, the tint of the, the yarn. And I agreed with her. Well, we, we got the ball rolling. And I sent sap samples of it to the designer and he, he flipped out. He said, no, no, that's not what I designed. It's too dark. So, you know, of course I, I scrambled and, and um, realized, well, it's too late. We're gonna have these darker, we call it the ancient pattern, which is typical. They have all kinds of, cat every clan will have a modern and an ancient or a hunter, they might have four or five different shades of the same color, <clears throat> same, same pattern, different, different shades of color. Anyway, um, so I, I wrote a poem about that, kind of lamenting the fact I had screwed up and it was a big screw up. And then since then, I also contracted with the mill to reproduce the brighter color, which he originally intended and of course, wrote a poem about that to to you know address address that and um, and all's good now. 
So we're the sole, you know, owners, the society of, of this, of the Martha's Vineyard district time. Oh, wow. So the, and again, they're, they're available at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Uh, Correct. Or, uh, or the website or on the website, they can, they can see how to, you know, get a hold of the, and, and we, we have a little uh, Titan store. So you, you're a poet and I, I know I'm putting you on the spot and you probably don't have anything prepared um, because I didn't ask you to prepare ahead of time, but do you have a poem with you? Yeah, sure. Of course. You know, you have to keep one in your pocket all the time, don't you? Yes. Oh my gosh. So you are, yes, you're the true poet. Well, you know, I'm, poem I'm Edgar Towns, you know, I'm Edgar Towns Poet Laureate. That's my claim to fame. Yeah. So you, I'll read a poem. Okay. This is um, a poem I wrote originally called Island Song. And it was for the Obamas when they first came here after he became president. It was when they had the financial crisis, you know, and he was, he was coming to the vineyard for the first time. And, and um, I felt, you know, the island's a good place to come for him because we have a reputation of letting famous people relax. I like to think that. It was like that when I was young in the 50s here and in the 60s, we get all these famous people come and, you know, they could we'd leave them alone for the most part. Anyway, so then I needed to write a poem for some occasion to do with the Scottish Society. So Island Song morphed into right Highland Song. And uh, it actually has been set to music, this poem. Who set it and, to music? Um, um, very, very talented member of our group called Dorian Lopes. He sings in, I think, the Baptist Church in Tisbury. And he's, he's a co-manager um, of our Scottish, internationally acclaimed Scottish Society singers. Um, and they are a big part of our burnt supper and time day. And every time we get together, where there's a you know, the whole membership, then the singers come out and sing Scottish songs. We had a fellow from Scotland come over. It was a friend of Bill Romans, the manager of the club I'm sitting in. And he, he gave our address to Robert Burns, you know, called the Immortal Memory, which is the keynote speech at our Burns Supper. And after hearing Dorian sing his solo of Amazing Grace, he said, I never heard anyone, in all of Scotland, and he's a Burns historian, never heard anyone sing Amazing Grace like Dorian Lopes from Little Old Martha's Vineyard. So Dorian put Highland Song to music and I've been touched. I, it brings tears to your eyes. I, I'm just a, you know, simple poet. That, I'm not a poet. I'm a doc builder that likes to write. And to hear a group of people singing something you wrote is just, it transforms it, you know, and it takes off on you. But anyway, so I, I changed Island Song and you you can you can kind of figure out how, how it would have been the words you know would have changed feel the peace of solitude along our burns and on our bends pick the fruit of summer from our meadows with your friends drink the cool fresh bounty deep beneath our strands eat our freshest harvest reaped by highland hands Walk our windswept stretches where ships have come to grief. Stroll our heathered hillsides. Let them lull you off to sleep. Lay upon your back as the stars hang down on high. Stretch your fingers out till they touch our jet black sky. May the peace of Highland living settle in your bones. May the lightness of your being stir memories of your home. May you cherish our first greeting, dear as our last song. May you always feel the blessing of the Highlands all life long. Wow, what a welcoming, soothing poem. Uh, the imagery brings you right to peace. That's the idea. And I can see that. So do you see the similarities between the vineyard culture and the Scottish culture? Especially in the people. 
and the land and the, and the focus on the land, it sounds like. You know, when we went to the little island off the coast to the West Coast, where my parents had been 30 years before called Muck, M-U-C-K. They went there because the, the laird that owned the island was a McEwen and my dad was researching his ancestry. We walked off the little ferry as it came into the harbor and just looked around. And it looked like the Allen farm on steroids. You know, that's the way I described it. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, if you live on the vineyard and you go to Scotland, it's like you went all this way and you just came home again. Wow. Wow, that's something to, for vineyarders to treasure and to think of, you know, how we are all connected through so many things, but we're not all that different no matter where we go in the world, even though the topography might be different, the climates might be different uh, in other places, the people can, I mean, we're all connected. And it sounds like Scott, being a part of the Scottish Society of Martha's Vineyard is, is kind of being a part of that, that um, desire to want to connect and communicate with, with each other and, and the earth. Yeah, it makes you realize that life is such a blessing, you know. We really are all blessed. <laughs>